Hi, everyone. Right. Um, I'm Anna Rothschild. I am a science reporter and the host of Science Magic Show Hooray, which is a, a science series for kids and also just the young at heart, uh, produced here at the Washington Post. I am so happy to be with you all today, and I'd like to send a special shout out to our audience um, watching across, across post platforms, including on Twitch. So uh, the vice president's a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but we have a very special panel for you guys today. I am delighted to welcome this accomplished group of astronauts. <laughs> so first off, we have Leland Melvin and Nicole Stott. They are both retired astronauts from the shuttle era. And I think between the two of them, they've spent over 120 days in space. <laughs> Um, then we have Victor Glover. Um, he'll be among the first to fly on SpaceX's Crew Dragon. And finally, we have Chris Ferguson, who will be on the first flight of Boeing's commercial craft, the Starliner. Mm -hmm. So um, the US hasn't sent anyone to space from US soil in about seven years. And I'm wondering what, in your perspective, the, the sort of um, American perspective of uh, astronauts is and sort of um, our, our space exploration in general is. And how do you think these new missions are going to change that sort of public perception? Nicole, do you want to start? Sure. I think um, I, I'm really excited to get uh, astronauts uh, launching again from US soil. I'm really excited to see these two gentlemen uh, make their way to space on those vehicles. And I think that. One of the things that's happened as a result of this seven years um, between uh, that last shuttle flight that, that Chris commanded and now is that um, in a thankful way, because I, I think we should have kept flying the space shuttle myself, but um, I'm, is I'm that there, yeah, there's, there's an awareness that's been like revitalized. Um, we went through a little bit of a slump where I think Sandy said in the earlier platform, like, well, what are you guys doing now that NASA, you know, shut down, um, and NASA being associated with uh, with the space shuttle? And I like that there's this resurgence, there's this awareness, and that we are again considering that not only as U.S. astronauts but our international community, we have for the last 20 years been circling this planet, you know, 16 times a day on the International Space Station, peacefully, quietly, successfully doing one of, if not the most complex things we've ever done. And I think even as we look at uh, launching again from US soil, we are looking at doing that as a mix of um, this international community that's going to continue to take us even further into space together. You know, space has been this um, very sort of international communal effort, I mean, for a long time now. And how do you see this new, uh, these new launches from US soil potentially changing that or enhancing that? Uh, Leland, do you want to take it? I think, you know, I think the biggest part of it is we're, we're going to look at this commercial entity that's bringing up, you know, SpaceX and Boeing and all of these vehicles going up where kids are now looking at not just working for NASA anymore, but working for this private sector. And, you know, when Elon launched his Tesla Roadster to space, you know, you saw how many tweets and follows that happened with that. And I think it's a way that we'll get more people looking at the space program and more kids thinking about science and, and being an entrepreneur and an inventor and doing these things. So I think it's going to really revolutionize the way that we can get more scientists in the mix in the future. Do you think that, um, do, do any of you sort of see this, these new missions as a, a play for American dominance as well? No, oh. I, I, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's, there, I mean, I think there's always going to be a mix of that. I would like to think of it as like a leadership. Uh, you know, a, a way forward for all of us to continue working together. I mean, I think about the partnership that we have in place that's so wonderful. You know, we had a lot of people saying, well, why are we launching with the Russians on the Soyuz spacecraft? I'm like, we've been doing that in parallel with shuttle for years. And so it just became, you know, like public knowledge, I guess, when the shuttle retired. And I think that's, that's what it is. It's, I don't, well, maybe I'm naive. I don't like to think of it as a dominance thing. I like to think of it as a leadership thing, as an active participant in what we are doing for humanity um, to move forward. I think this is essential, really. Um, you know, I, I, we witnessed a, a couple of weeks ago, right, Russian had a, uh, the Russian Soyuz had an incident where uh, they, uh, you know, safely recovered a crew, but they didn't make it to orbit. 
Um, it's very important we have global redundancy to get back and forth to the International yeah. Space Station. We've been without it for seven years, and, and here's a chance not only to, to enjoy this resurgence in human spaceflight from the United States of America, but to do it in a commercial fashion, right? You do it sort of a, a fee for service. And will what happened in space, uh, will what happened successfully to the airlines over 100 years, you know, eventually happen in space? We'll be able to safely go back and forth and bring the cost down, and what will this all mean 50 years from now? And how cool is it that, Victor, I think you, on your, your flight, are looking at not just going as U.S. astronauts, but potentially having international astronauts on that flight with you when you go your first time to space. Absolutely. On, on one of our new commercial vehicles. Absolutely. And, and to you know, reference the question that you asked earlier, you know, I think it's going to re-emphasize uh, what we do and what we've been doing. You know, since the shuttle retired in 2011, NASA has not been sitting on our hands at all. We've been working with these two partners to develop this capability, and we've been also developing Orion and SLS, our capability that once we do successfully commercialize low Earth orbit, as our national leadership has asked us to do for several years, we can move beyond, you know, into the vicinity of the moon and the gateway, and then eventually onto Mars. And so it's, uh, it's getting the awareness that we are doing those things, though, when the launch happens in your backyard, I think we hit people in the heart and we encourage them to go fill their heads with the details of what we're doing. And that's what I think is going to change. Right. So I would love to ask you a little bit about how you're feeling in preparation <laughs> for your very first time in space. What yeah. are the emotions going through your head? And, um, you know, how have your colleagues here, even on stage, helped to kind of boost you up and prepare you for this trip. Actually, I'm glad you said it that way. So <laughs> to, to watch what they've done, I was very inspired. And, and again, that, that inspirational piece is a very important part of this. Uh, and so to see what they were doing and, and the inspiration that it gave me to, to pursue this, this career field, um, it's great to just sit up here with them and, and to commune with, with these veterans. And then just being assigned to my first mission, period, was amazing. And then to add to it, I'm a test pilot. In the Navy, I flew the, the Hornet and the Super Hornet and got to test out software and hardware. And so to fly a new spaceship is just, that also is a dream. And so to combine them, I kind of feel like I'm getting more than my fair share, you know? <laughs> but uh, it's awesome. Training for space is, is great. And um, flying on and off of a carrier is one of the most amazing things I've done in my professional life. So I really hope that uh, launching into low Earth orbit, it beats that. So. Excellent. Chris, you have the sort of unique position of um, having uh, trained for missions uh, in, in two different ways. And I'm wondering how your current training is different from the training that you did for the shuttle era. So, um, yeah, of course, I have, I have a couple shuttle flights under my belt with a few of these esteemed individuals. And, uh, and about uh, seven years ago, I, I made a big shift over the Boeing company. Uh, and the, the premise was, hey, we'd, we'd love to have you come over, maybe parlay some of your experience you had in shuttle. We're developing this new commercial crew spacecraft, and dot, 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 we'd love to have you fly it. <laughs> so as you Boat. can imagine, you know, a guy, <laughs> a, a guy who, uh, who really enjoys the challenges associated with spaceflight to not only have a chance to fly a new one, but also to be engaged at the ground level in the development of it. So, uh, you know, so to speak, have my fingerprints, uh, in addition to, of course, to this great Boeing team that's been putting this vehicle together for the last seven years, and uh, it's wonderful. Uh, and now we're back in training again. I sort of am back in my old stomping grounds in Houston, Texas, spending time with, uh, with uh, as a matter of fact, one of the individuals I'm going to fly with, Eric Bowe. Uh, we flew together on SDS-126. So even though I've been separated for about seven years, it's great to be back in the fold again. And, uh, you know, the, sort of there's, it's a badgeless world. We're all in training. We're all there to accomplish a single objective. I may happen to wear a Boeing badge. You know, uh, Victor wears a NASA badge, but uh, really the end objective is to, is to safely get back and forth to space and, and reestablish America's presence as a, as a launch provider. Can you actually talk a little bit more about what the collaboration between Boeing and SpaceX and NASA are like and sort of what role NASA plays in, in this relationship? I don't know, Victor, if you want to start and give the SpaceX part. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the company is designing the vehicle and building the vehicle. Um, but we, as the operator, the user, and eventually the risk taker when we get to launch day, we give input. And as the rookie in the group, I give less input. But the veterans that are a, a part of this, uh, they give their input um, from their experience. And that helps influence the design. And so it's, it, it is a good partnership. I think SpaceX's culture and NASA's culture are different. And when we get to launch day, I think we will have both moved toward this center and learned from each other and uh, appreciated the best that each of the entities brings to the table. 
And from a, a Boeing perspective, so you know, NASA uh, or Victor talks about uh, sort of the provider. Well, we are the provider. So this is an interesting uh, thing in that we have, uh, you know, we've been instrumental in, in putting the design together and getting ready to fly it, and then we will actually, you know, have some skin in the game, so to speak, by have a, a, having a Boeing person on board. Really. And, and the, you know, <laughs> and, and the question is, um, you know, really, I, I think Boeing wants to. Um, uh, you know, they want to emphasize that, hey, it's a Boeing product, it's got a Boeing name on the side, we're going to put a Boeing test pilot in there to prove, in fact, that, uh, you know, we've, we're, we're in the ground uh, level of, you know, what hopefully will be a resurgence in, in commercial uh, transportation for people and cargo back and forth to low Earth orbit. Okay. What's really interesting to me about this, too, is that when you look at, it, and there's kind of this, this difference happening now in whether it's in the way the contracting is done with NASA, you know, fixed price versus um, cost plus and things. And, and in the end, the, you know, SpaceX and Boeing, it's their vehicle. You know, they, they, they're developing it. NASA will be customers, you know, mm -hmm. um, utilizing it. Um, and then the market will hopefully open up for more, but it's, it becomes, um, you know, the Boeing and the SpaceX vehicle, whereas before the space shuttle, the space station were NASA's vehicle. And, and the thing that's interesting to me is we've always used commercial companies to right. do this. Right. It's, it's, it's just a little bit of a twist on the ownership in the end, kind of the, the relationship between the two organizations, and then the name on the how rocket. It, the name on the rocket and how it cannot. So the partnership, I think, is just like with our international partners, I think the way this is growing and developing is really, really a, a positive and mutually beneficial thing. Great. Um, one of the things that's coming from this partnership is that there's likely going to be more space tourism. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts on space tourism. So both from in, in terms of thinking about how it might broaden people's perspectives on Earth, but also thinking about you know, what new opportunities there are for science in space. I, th I think the tourism piece is, is critical to ensure that, you know, Sandy talked about this perspective shift that we get as astronauts. We look back at the planet at 17,500 miles per hour, going around it every 90 minutes. And how, wh when I went to space, I thought my aha moment would be when I installed the Columbus Laboratory from the European Space Agency. But that paled in comparison to when we broke bread with Russians and Germans and people we used to fight against and the first female commander. You know, it's like a Benetton commercial where we were floating over <laughs> having yeah. our, our meal. And, and that piece showed me that it's about people coming together as one civilization, working as a team. And if you can get more people up there that are not professional astronauts that are going to be bringing this experience back down to their communities, to their hometowns, that will help influence the science and the future scientists, you know, and inspire that next generation. And I think that's what the beauty of bringing these other people that are not military test pilots. No, no hate there, right? Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> I agree. But, but bringing everyone on board to get that experience is really important. Absolutely. Do you think that there's also a sort of perspective shift that happens when you are that far above Earth looking down on it as well? How does it change what you think about the major issues here? Oh back, my gosh, yeah. Back at home. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think. You know, even, you know, I look at like three of us as retired um, NASA astronauts and, you know, our active friend here our rookie. and <laughs> our Boeing guy who's going to be like, we want to be in their pockets, of course, to go, you know, go back with them. Um, if we could get that miniaturization technology, that would be awesome. But I think that, um, you know, all of us feel like we, ha I, I, obligation is kind of a weird word, but like this, it's like, I feel like it's my mission now to share that experience, to, to bring that back to Earth. And really, we talk about it all the time. Leela and I, we talk about it all the time about like there's really, I kind of sum it up like there's three lessons I learned from flying in space. And they are like so super simple. And I wish everybody that leaves here today would be thinking about them every day in some way is that we live on a planet, we're all Earthlings, and the only border that matters is the thin blue line that blankets us all. And if we consider ourselves in that way, and we're when we look at that, we're Earthlings. Earthlings, Earthlings right there. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. and it, it changes everything you think about. And you know, talked about science. And from a, a scientific standpoint, if we don't work together as one race, the human race, we will falter. And it's not that the Earth is fragile. We're the fragile ones. The Earth will keep doing its thing, yes. going around the planet every year. 
but we're going to be the ones that are going to be burped out. And so I think that we, we need to make sure that we, we look at these systems, these ecosystems, these relationships, these things that are happening on the planet to ensure that we are here in the next 50 years. And when you think about December 20, uh, 24th of 1968, it was when this, this picture was taken by Bill Anders from Apollo 8 called Earthrise. And we're at, the, we're at the inflection point right now. We're at the 50th anniversary of that, December 24th of 2018. What is the next 50 years going to be like? And what are we going to do collectively to ensure that we're still here? Um, you know, I'm sure you're asked all the time uh, what's, what advice you have for, for kids who, you know, want to get this super cool job. Um, I'm going to ask a similar question, but with a little bit of a twist. What's something outside of the classroom that you guys did that helped prepare you for this job? Since I know you are constantly learning all the time. So what's something else? Music. You know, it, it's interesting because you get we all get approached. Mm -hmm. What's the secret sauce? How do you become yeah, an Where's astronaut? the checklist? <laughs> and what I, what I tell everybody is have an interest. Have some other interest that, that doesn't involve science, technology, space. I mean, have an interest. Have a passion in life. I, I don't care whether it's skydiving or playing the drums or, uh, or going to Patagonia. You've got to have another passion someplace else because that's what makes you uniquely different than everybody else who is incredibly intelligent that applies for these sort of programs. So I, that's, that's my share. Yeah, I would say that, uh, well, I have a, a general three-point uh, message that I take to schools when I go talk to kids, and it's to be gritty, not stopping in the face of challenges, to be a lifelong learner, both inside and outside the classroom, and to be a good person and teammate. And I really emphasized in that last one, you know, team sports was a big part of that for me, and then going into the military and serving. Uh, but be, finding something bigger than you to, to serve and to be a part of and um, working on um, yourself and making sure that you're taken care of so that you can have the capacity to take care of someone else. And the missions that we're training for now, you know, the, the low Earth orbit environment of the space station is a great place to find out what space does to our bodies. And then as we go further into our solar system, we're going to spend more time away from the comfort of Earth. And so we live with each other in a confined space for an extended period of time. And it's important that we have our things taken care of so that we can take care of one another. So being a good teammate, I think, is a huge part of that. Okay. Yeah, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is. I mean, I think there's a real element to, like, the creativity, curiosity side of it and, you know, like, the continuing to, to learn. Um, and that is outside the classroom. And I love when I see students um, that have teachers that are engaging them outside of the classroom with what they're learning in the classroom. And I think as we become adults, we want to do that more and more, too. The experiential side of it is really important. And, and yeah, I mean, have a passion for something. That it, is, it is not a checklist. You know, NASA has some very uh, defined criteria. But I love, I got a picture of my class um, that we were chosen in 2000. There's 17 of us. And not one of the people in that picture got there the same way. Not one. Right. We all wanted to be astronauts, decided that at some point, and we're fortunate enough to get in the seat in that picture. But there is not one. The story is not the same for anybody in that picture. And I think that's such a wonderful thing. Because when you fly in space, further from Earth, in these more, you want a diverse group of people that are bringing the different strengths and the passions and going to make it not only professionally uh, successful, but going to have some personality behind it, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when I was uh, interviewing to become an astronaut, I think, Fergie, we were in the same week, weren't we? Mm -hmm. And we have to write an essay, and there's an hour-long interview and all these things. And I remember in my essay, I remembered something from my dad. He said to make sure that you have fun and you share the ball. I mean, I play a lot of sports and things. And I think we sometimes try to be the top and the number one, and we don't always have the ability to share. And so sharing the ball and making sure that everyone is included in the journey and in the mission and to, again, lifelong learning, experiential learning is so important. Put the phone down for a minute and build something, create something, you know, um, design something. But, uh, but it's sharing the ball and having a good time. On, on that note, um, in, in the spirit of sharing and sort of inspired a little bit by hidden figures, I would love if each of you could maybe mention one person you admire who helps you get to space who is not actually an astronaut. Um, it could be a job title or it could be a particular person who has really, like, 
helped you along the way? I, I'll, yeah, my, my family, my I, family unit, my wife and my kids, <laughs> I, you know? <laughs> And it's like, oh, you, you're, you have to say that. But I mean, it's true. It's we, we've been, we, this year is our 20th year of being a Navy family. Yeah. And so we've moved all over the world in service to our country, and they serve just as much as we do. And so um, they've been a great support structure and a great motivation. And one of the great things about this job is that we get to share. The first time I put on the space suit and went underwater to learn how to spacewalk, my kids were right there as I got lowered in the water. Wow. And that is, I can't tell you. That's cool. That alone would make this a dream job. That is it. I mean, that I, it really is. Because there are teachers, there are professional you know, mentors. I mean, I, I know I would not have the suit on without that. But I, will I look we at it ultimately? Like, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I bought it from the... But the, really, I mean, that, I love that you had your family there. And what I found to be like the key in, in my own personal readiness, but I think um, for my family as a whole, was really encouraging them to be part of my crew, yeah. to meet the people I was training with, to be at those events, to, to really and truly feel like they were part of my crew. S so they understood what was going on before I went, they, before I got home, knew what was gonna be happening when I got home, and they were just an integral part of what I was experiencing every day while I was there. Excellent. Yeah. Um, in the last few minutes of this program, and I'm sorry to, to cut off uh, Leland and Chris, we actually asked our audience um, to send in questions from kids. So kids from all around the world have sent in some questions for these astronauts. Hopefully they're, they're watching the live stream right now. Um, the first one comes from Sienna, who, in te who attends an international school in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, she actually asked a bunch of questions, so her question ends a little abruptly because we just picked one of them. <laughs> How many days do astronauts stay in space? <laughs> no. There was a stream. There was a stream. Oh, yeah. That's there were, awesome. There were about seven oh, questions. So, um, so yeah. Uh, to see them. If, if only one of you could answer each one, that would be great. So, Leland, do you want to answer? Twenty-three those? days in space. Oh, 104 days in space. Chris, 44 total, I think. And soon to be. Training for a six-month mission. Yeah, we'll see. Great. Um, okay, our next question comes from Braith, who lives in Baltimore. Baltimore. My name is oh, Blake Wartenzi, and is it possible to get from galaxy to galaxy? <laughs> is it possible to get from galaxy to galaxy, Grace <laughs> asks. Thank you, dude. I'm glad he's thinking big. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're Please. gonna have to master this whole light speed thing, I think, <laughs> right. before we uh, get galaxy to galaxy. I mean, if you think about it, the nearest star is about two light, one point light years away, and it would take practically forever, even at today's speed, just to reach our nearest star. Galaxy to galaxy, it's out there on the horizon. You know, but think about it. Somebody in one of the earlier panels said something about how we have to really honor, like, our imagination. We have to think about, in the last 60 years, what we've done, and what was really, unimaginable back then and how we're sitting here talking to you about like multiple different kinds of vehicles yeah. going to a space station back to the moon onto mars you know we we just have to figure out how to do it so his question was it is. is it possible is it possible, is it possible? Yeah, yeah. i think so. anything's yeah. possible Absolutely. Kind of problem, maybe one possible. day he'll, he'll develop the technology yeah, exactly yeah. please take, on you. take us <laughs> on you brother <laughs> <laughs> all right our next question is maybe a little tricky it's from mia who lives in san francisco how do they make the fuel tanks balance so when they launch the rocket, it does not um, tip over? Ah, that's This girl's going to be an engineer for sure. Yeah, dig in the shirt, too. Yeah. <laughs> First, send us a resume. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, they fuel those rockets very carefully. The pressures and temperatures uh, that they have to uh, match when they fuel those rockets are very carefully controlled. So I would say that very carefully. And there are also some structures out there. The, the framework that is next to the rockets when they fuel them also provide support but wow that is a great question and uh, she's clearly thinking in uh, the direction our NASA engineers do so send us a resume yeah. the mom math answer or mom answer is math <laughs> <laughs> but you know one of the cool things about like the space shuttle is you know and I always thought it was so interesting it's on the launch pad and you've got this the orbiter the white orbiter and the two solid rocket boosters in the tank and the orbiter is hanging off the tank and then the tank is attached to the two boosters and the whole thing is attached to the launch platform by eight bolts oh wow you know four of them at the base of each booster 
And one of the super cool things about after you fly on a space shuttle is they present you, each crew member, with one of those bloats that are bolts, bolts that has like pyrotechnically blown to get you to space and they make bookends out of it. It's oh, really? really? Cool. <laughs> really cool. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, I really like our next question. It's uh, from Josh from Connecticut. Do you ever feel disconnected from, uh, from Earth? Do you ever miss anyone in space? Oh. Mm. You know, there's so many ways in, in lower in the space station to keep in touch. I mean, we have internet now. Mm -hmm. You think about it, you could make a phone call if you had to. Right. I mean, think about John Glenn making a phone call from space <laughs> 60 years ago. You know, it was just something that didn't exist. So Video there are conferences. there are great ways to stay in touch. You can watch your family. Yeah. Now, you know, we need to start thinking about this, however, when we reach out to Mars, where the time difference could be, you know, you can't talk real time because right. you're, you know, 20 or 40 minutes, depending on which side of the sun you're on. So this whole idea of long-term separation from family is is something real, right? We, I mean, we have to deal with human emotions, and, right. and uh, you know, our next step is going to be out to a place called the Gateway on the other side of the moon, mm -hmm. and uh, that's going to be interesting because it's days away instead of just hours away in low Earth orbit. So I'm pretty excited about this next step that we will take on our way to Mars. And when you don't see Earth anymore out the window, right. one of the advantages we have in the missions we've done so far is that beautiful planet is there, and quite honestly, you you know, you are separated from it, you're missing it, but you're I don't know about the rest of you, but I felt more connected to everything and everyone on that place than I sometimes do when I'm right down here in the middle of it. And that's what I think about. Imagine that point where you're traveling and you just, you don't have sight of that wow. anymore. That'll be an interesting time. Yeah. I watch my family eat my birthday cake while I did <laughs> in space with no birthday cake. <laughs> that was not cool, but you guys it was, brought me birthday cake. You, me birthday you cake. did. So birthday cake then. Yeah, there is, yeah. <laughs> so you don't you just missed the birthday cake. <laughs> um, unfortunately the time is almost out, but I would love to invite everyone to give um, our astronauts a round of applause there to American heroes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Bye.